My grandfather was alderman of the fourth ward when his father was alderman. They served together. And I have a binder in the back and I brought it just to share, but it's like this thick and it's full of newspaper articles from when he served. And guess what? We find some of the same fights in the newspaper articles that are in that binder back there now. And I know that Terry was around then and he's still around, thank God. And uh, I wanted him to try to talk, just give a little history, but also give us some direction and some action and a charge as a community moving forward. So first, Introduction of yourself, and then maybe it's a little history of um, African Americans by being Black History Month in politics in the city of St. Louis. Well, let me see. Uh, I am Terry Kennedy. I have a twin brother by the name of Gary. You know, they have to rhyme. So Gary and Terry. Um, yeah, it's kind of jive, but we're okay with it. Um, let me see. I, my family was originally in St. Louis on my mother's side in the Ville area, and then we moved into what was then the 18th Ward at Enright and Whittier uh, in, oh, in the early 60s. Um, my father's originally from East St. Louis. He came to St. Louis after the East St. Louis race riot. Uh, my family was one of the first black families into East St. Louis on my father's side, uh, moving up into East St. Louis around 1897 or so, my grandmother. Uh, and she had my father in 1910. Uh, he was on the younger end of her children. Uh, my grandmother was, of course, and grandparents were all a part of the first generation born completely free. All of my great-grandparents had been slaves or held in bondage here in the United States. Uh, and during that East St. Louis race riot, uh, a pack of White mobs came to our family's home, threw uh, torches into the front of the house, shot into the back. My grandmother took her children and jumped out the side window and for 24 hours hid in high grass and weeds. And then after that, tried to make their way to St. Louis. Uh, the Eads Bridge at that time was blocked. They were not letting black folks over. So she made out of planks and other pieces of wood a raft and floated her children over to St. Louis. And so if she had not done that, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Uh, and that was in uh, what, 1917. So 2017 was the 100th commemoration, which we did on Eads Bridge uh, between uh, the East St. Louis uh, contingent and St. Louis. We had both the mayors from East St. Louis and St. Louis on that bridge as well. We had about 2,000 people on that bridge. We marched from the area where things happened to the, to the Eads Bridge and there at the dividing line between Missouri and Illinois where they both meet is where we had the, uh, the, comm the commemorative ceremony. Um, those of you who might know jazz, I had a cousin uh, named Shirley Horn. She was a jazz musician. Uh, her student uh, was Roberta Flack. And my aunt taught Miles Davis music there in East St. Louis. Um, and that's how my cousin Shirley Horn got into the industry. She was brought in there by uh, Miles Davis, who was a close friend of the family. Uh, the Horns ended up, my grandmother's name was Horn, they ended up in Washington, D.C. because of the East St. Louis race riot. Uh, many of you may not be aware, but that uh, Kenlock was created uh, mostly by uh, at the time, the Urban League and other black business people as the place where the refugees from East St. Louis could, to, could live. So we had a family contingent out in Kenlock, and they would walk from, my father and his brother would walk along the train tracks from East St. Louis all the way to Kenlock. Well, you know, we're talking about 1918, 1920. Uh, black folks didn't have a lot of cars, and so either it was horse and buggy or they walked. Um, so it is from that background uh, that we come to uh, our work here today. So my father grew up actually on the street boxing for exhibitions, because as soon as he got to be a teenager, the, um, the depression hit. And so they didn't have a place to live. And so he did that as a means to make money, and then from there ended up being uh, the chair, the president of his union. He was a union organizer in the early days of unions. When union boss, when businesses would hire thugs to beat up the union workers, who were out there um, picketing. So I remember my father sometimes having to go to the picket line with a baseball bat 
because the thugs would come and try to beat them up. Uh, America has not always been kind to us. And so as people of color, we have to be clear about that history so that we know what our work is today. It's not a matter of, in my opinion, that we are fighting the same struggles. We are making advances. But the areas in which we have to address are the same. Issues of economics, issues of health, issues of education, issues of equity as it relates to uh, political power. All of those have been issues since we've been here. And I'm supposed to be talking about myself right now, right? And I hopped on my soapbox. But we must be clear that and not get ourselves confused that the struggle has not continued and that we have not made advances. I've heard some young folks say, well, you know, we haven't. What have we achieved? Well, you wouldn't be able to say that if there hadn't been some achievement. You wouldn't, be able, you wouldn't even be on the front of the bus if it had not been any achievement. And there's been quite a bit right here in the city of St. Louis. Most of us may not be aware that St. Louis had one of the largest abolitionist organizations in the history of the United States. It was called, I said abolitionist, I didn't say civil rights, I said abolitionist organization. It was called the Knights of Liberty and the Daughters of Tabor. They had organized for 40,000 black folks to fight for freedom in this country. Their plan was to take over the city of Atlanta in 1850. They were organized right here in St. Louis and based here. Uh, the persons that developed it was a man by the name of Moses Dixon, and they called his wife Mother Dixon. And from there, they trained these 40,000 African Americans secretly to be able to fight for freedom. And so according to W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote the book uh, Black Reconstruction, he says that if it had not been for that organization, when the North started losing the war, they allowed black folks to join the Union Army. What they got were 40,000 already trained black folks ready to fight. That turned the tide of the Civil War on behalf of the North. So our freedom came from these hands, from the hands of the generations before us. But because if you always listen to the lion telling the story, the lamb always loses. If we always listen to somebody else trying to tell our stories, you will never hear this story. And luckily, one of the descendants of the Knights of Liberty and the Daughters of Tabor who had been initiated into the organization wrote a book about it. And that single volume, which is about 300 pages, is where a bulk of the information, what is so significant about this organization is that Moses Dixon helped found Lincoln University. Still further, he worked with Charles Tandy, you know Tandy Park, as well as uh, the park that's right there at West Bell and Sarah. You familiar with it? Well, that, that park that the, who is named after was also working with Moses Dixon. And that individual, you know, uh, was the first black person who served as a foreign diplomat to any country. He was appointed by Ulysses S. Grant to be the representative to uh, Liberia. So a lot of this is happening right here in our own backyard. We're just not aware of it. Uh, may I continue? If I'm okay. History are the events of the past. But not every event of the past is historical. Historical events are those that have shaped the future or changed the direction of human trajectory. And so what we want to be clear about are not just everything that happened in the past, but those significant events that have changed and shaped the present. That is what is, what is key. And so our political force here in St. Louis has really been one to reckon with. But because we don't know the history, we're not clear of our impact. Immediately after the Civil War, there were several political conventions of black folks to fight for and to increase our rights as citizens. Uh, one of those was founded right there at what was then Locust and 7th Street. They had a black political convention back in been 1878. Um, in that same year, you had a Freedom Day celebration right at what is now Broadway in Washington. There was a hall called Liberty Hall, and they had a great celebration about the ending of slavery. But they also had a convention. Their intent was to create a black political party and to begin the empowerment of freed black folks as well as to assist black folks coming up from the South, right here in the city of St. Louis. Uh, they did create this organization. Charles Tandy was a part of it. 
Moses Dixon was like the secretary general of it and several other folks. That later split into two different organizations. You know, in the, in the, hum, in the, in the ongoing human affairs, we have issues with one another sometimes, but they did continue to work together and they split into two different organizations. And then later growing out of that uh, became a political movement in the city of St. Louis of one fighting for black education, public education for black folks. And then two, uh, they had three issues, political education, uh, education in the public schools. Uh, they also had one about health care and then about jobs. This is before the civil rights movement. This is also before there was an NAACP. Uh, out of that grew the St. Louis NAACP and then later the Urban League. The St. Louis Urban League was actually founded, you know, to give relief to the survivors of the East St. Louis race riot. So we have been, if I may just back up, power is defined as your capacity to get your work done. You're considered powerful when you are able to achieve your goals. If your goal, for example, is to pick up a pencil that you dropped on the floor and you're unable to do it, you're considered powerless in that area. But if you can achieve the goals that you go after, then you say you have power. And so black empowerment, we're really are talking about increasing our capacity to be able to achieve the goals that we have set out that are important to us. Politics is the art and science of gaining, maintaining, and using power. Power being your capacity to get stuff done. So you're looking at the, the different ways that you are willing to use your power can be given different definitions. For example, if all you want to do is, if you're willing to lie, cheat, and steal, and kill people to get power, you can be considered Machiavellian. If your perspectives on power is to share that power and have a group process of decision making, you can be considered yourself a Democrat. So those different ways that people are willing to use power can be defined and categorized. Now, my point is, is that our movement for empowerment in St. Louis, as well as America, period, was one towards equality. And it has had different, am I, I'm not losing you here, am I? It has had different manifestations over time. It has been the abolitionist movement, the back to Africa movement, it has been the civil rights movement, it has been the black power movement, the African conscious movement, a series of different ways that we have approached our right for justice wherever we are. Um, and so then what, you're, what ultimately happened is that as black folks began to enter into the Democratic Party, we began to see black elected officials in the city of St. Louis. And that was with uh, Chambers, Jordan Chambers. You know, he moved black folks from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. So that was not fully just an explanation of who I am, but uh, it gives you some idea of, of the direction we're going. It was better. <laughs> I knew it would be. Mm -hmm. So Chambers, so was Chambers the first African-American um, alder person in the city of St. Louis? He was a committee man. He was a committee man. He so the first African-American to hold an elected seat in the city of St. Louis was a committee man? Yeah, before the first black alder person was elected. Okay. Now, what, at the time, you know, black folks primarily, from my understanding, were part of the Republican Party, because mm -hmm. that's the party of Lincoln. You know, people said that Lincoln did try to help free black folks, though mm -hmm. his emancipation proclamation did not free anybody. <laughs> Let's be clear, because that said that all, all folks who are held in bondage in the states in rebellion against the union are free. Mm -hmm. Well, the union had no control over those states, so it didn't free anybody. Oh, but yeah. it, did, it did create a political environment whereby it would encourage folks to get free from there and run to the north. Now, mm -hmm. Uh, after leaving the Republican Party at that time was not into black folks having political positions. Mm -hmm. So the agreement that, that Chambers and others, including Fred Weathers, all of them either mm -hmm. have a park or a uh, post office named after them. Uh, uh, Fred Weathers has the one over there on Kings Highway. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. He used to North be, Kingsway. he worked in the Jordan Chambers organization. He was the committee man of the 18th. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, what we call him what, what? Mr. Uh, Mr. Bull. He was a big <laughs> man. Every, every morning he'd walk his dogs down the street. He was big. Oh, wow. We were children, so we didn't mess with Mr. Bull. Mm. Um, the point being there, though, is that um, they helped move black folks from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party that had made the promise to support 
black committee people and other black elected officials. That was their agreement. Mm -hmm. It did evolve into some black committee people and then finally some black older people. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may just clarify mm -hmm. a few things. Most people are not clear that there are really only three, four major positions of city elected officials. The city has a mayor, the comptroller, the president of the board, and the board of aldermen. Mm -hmm. Your license collector, your collector of revenue, the recorder of deeds are all county functions. Those are not city positions. Mm -hmm. The ones that I just mentioned are city positions. Out of those what, four different categories, the mayor, uh, the comptroller, the president of the board, only those three are considered full-time paid positions. An automatic position is considered a part-time position. That's how it's written in the charter. Mm -hmm. But that's not how the job is. Exactly. The work is more than part-time, <laughs> exactly. but all you're getting is a part-time pay. The base pay of an alderman is some $37,000. So you can easily work 80 hours a week. Easily do easily. that if you're really trying to do something in your community. Absolutely. And of course, the poorer your community, the more the you more have to work. do work if you're sincere in trying to get something done. So it, in many ways, it's a thankless job. And they think that you can do everything, including make the clouds part <laughs> at the right time of day. And you, you, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Board of Aldermen is to the city what the uh, House of Representatives is to the federal government. Okay. Mm -hmm. And most people get that confused. So you're, um, I did mention that your father was the Alderman of the 18th Ward and then you became the Alderman of the 18th Ward. Surely did. Mm -hmm. What were some of the same challenges that you and your father faced that you might even see still we face today? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> And we're still facing the same issues. First of all, let me say this. Uh, my father passed in office in 1988, in October of 1988. Uh, my brother and I and sisters were more on the radical end of things. We were uh, a part of the whole black conscious student movement. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody's ever read about the student walkouts in the public high schools in the 70s, we were the organizers. I mean, literally, I was the chairman of the Black Student Union at Vashon High School. Mm -hmm. And we would organize these walkouts. We were trying to get black studies in the public schools. We were trying to get three schools, high schools, other than Michon, named after black folks. We wanted one after Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Angela Davis. I forgot exactly how we chose those folks, but we, we like, you know, Angela Davis was cute to us. We wanted her, we wanted to have a school with her. We did get Dr. King. We didn't get Malcolm X or Angela Davis. But we also got black books and a black studies curriculum in the public schools as well at that time. But that didn't come because somebody felt good about giving it. That's because we emptied out Vashon, Sumner, Soldan, Beaumont, McKinley, uh, and Northwest all at the same time. We did organize as student, high school students, 14, 15, 16 doing this. Mm -hmm. I heard about that because I heard when you met, by the time you made it to Grand that SLU, some of the SLU college students well, had jumped in. And well, we, it, they didn't just jump in by accident. What we did was that we created a, each you know, school had their black student union. Mm -hmm. So all the high schools had a citywide black student association, representatives from each one of those schools. Mm -hmm. And then we created an association with the college black student union. Oh, okay. So the agreement was that when they saw us walk out, they would join us. Oh, okay. So wow. it didn't happen by accident. Right. <laughs> um, just like the term, you know, black power didn't happen by accident. We know that Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Touré came up with it. Well, they organized that. When he was down in Mississippi, one of the cities, he had people to go into the city first and prime people to say this chant. And when he said the right word, people started chanting it and it looked like it was spontaneous. Mm. And it wasn't. It was very well. You have to organize that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did know Stokely, Stokely Carmichael. Wow. I had met him, he had worked with him on several different issues. By that time, he was Kwame Touré. However, there are some people here that know him far better than, in St. Louis, far better than I. One mm -hmm. of those is Miss Alice Wyndham, mm -hmm. if anybody knows her. Alice Wyndham is mentioned in Malcolm X's uh, autobiography. She lived in Ghana when Ghana first got free. Oh, wow. And she became a, if you've ever seen the photograph of Malcolm X and his fingers like this, mm -hmm. Alice Wyndham took that picture. Oh, wow. And she's right here in St. Louis. She did that oh, in Ghana. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. The city so is so and rich. Her, her running buddy, as you used to say, her cutting partner, mm -hmm. was, was uh, Maya Angelou. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. 
in the city in one St. Louis. And he said that during that campaign, he can remember, I guess, encouraging the black people to vote on the North for him because he would get their streets paved like the streets that were paved right. on the South side. Mm -hmm. And he said that it worked, that that worked. And, and that a lot of the constituents on the North side never even went to were paved on the south side they just were taught and and it was learned behavior that the south side was just this amazing place and that we could be they could be like them and that that was one of the things you know of course he stood on the truth and he did things that he could he was not successful at that run for president of board of aldermen but at the same time i just remember him using the contrast in his campaign mm -hmm. now today i remember being asked questions during my campaign and still today, about why things happen on the south side and not on the north side. Can you give us some enlightenment on that and, and maybe? Well, I mean, at one point, the south side was you know, predominantly white. That is not the case today. So there are areas of South St. Louis whose conditions are beginning to run down like you see in North St. Louis. That is not the predominant thing that you see. I wouldn't say it's as much as about north and south as it is about black and white. There's a tendency to disenfranchise people of color wherever we are found. Um, and so what you're seeing in some of those areas is the case. St. Louis is an interesting place to be. Uh, I did have a chance to live away from, I lived in Washington, D.C. I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C., which I can tell you another whole experience about that place. But that gave me certainly a different view. Uh, St. Louis is this unique animal. We think. Don't be confused, and this is my analysis, and I used to do this in Alderman. I felt that my job partly as an elected official was to give political analysis. So I'm going to give you a little bit of that. The hype is, is that St. Louis is in the Midwest. What I would say to people, if it's in the Midwest, it's one of the few Midwestern cities I know that had slavery. So think about it. You can, you can advertise and market a thing any way you want that does not make it the truth. St. Louis certainly has more in common with the South than it does the Midwest. So you're talking about a place that had, uh, that had slavery since the 1720s here. They say the first major group of African Americans were brought up from Santa Domingo, that's Haiti, by a French man by the name of Frances Francisco Reynault. He brought up 500 Africans directly from Haiti. They didn't stop in New Orleans. They came straight up the Mississippi to here are uh, actually in the area of DeSoto and then into St. Louis. So you're talking about a place that has had slavery at least that long that's suddenly in the Midwest. Now, Missouri did not side with the South when it came to the war. They did not side with the Confederacy. They were, in theory, neutral. However, the first major battle of any black troops were right here in Missouri. They called it the, the Battle of Island Mound. These brothers and sisters, there was a, a form called the Toothman Form, this white guy who was a Confederate sympathizer. This is out by Kansas City. This was, he was a Confederate sympathizer. They took this man's form and made it a fort, and they called it Fort Africa. That was the first battle of any black troops. It's called the Battle of Island Mound. So Missouri was a slave sympathizing state, but it didn't side with the Confederacy. If you know anything about war, what happens is, is that the winning side occupies the losing side. They physically occupy that land and reorganizes its political, social, and economic systems so that the loser will not rise up against the winner again. This is what you saw when Nazi Germany lost. The other powers came in and reorganized, and then they built that wall. One part of it got, was under Russia, the other part Part of, the US, or part of the U.S. states and other countries. They, dis, they reorganized the losing force. And so during that period, they called that Reconstruction. When the South was reconstructed, what did they do? They took, form, they took the plantations from the uh, plantation owners and sold the land and the rest of that. Reorganized the social, not to a great extent as much as we wanted, but they reorganized the political system of the South. That is also when many African Americans got elected to Congress during that time period. In fact, you had almost as many elected black officials then, right after the Civil War, doing Reconstruction as you have today. My point. Missouri 
since it didn't side with the Confederacy, was not occupied and reorganized. And so you were still fighting many of the policies and laws that existed back in 1864. They still exist today. An example, the St. Louis Police Department was taken over in April of 1861 by the state government because they were concerned that black abolitionists getting together with some white sympathizers would take over the city armory and lead the city of St. Louis on the side of the Union. And the state was trying to be supposedly nonpartisan in the war. So the state took over the St. Louis Police Department in 1861. Well, the fight to bring it back under control of the city, the we didn't win that fight to what year did it come back? 2014. So you all following me? So that fight had started back then. There are lots of other laws who have their originality back in doing the slavery days in the state of Missouri that have never been changed. So if you're not clear in your political analysis, you will think that something is wrong with you and that we have not made advances because your work here is much harder than a place like Georgia and Atlanta because Atlanta had the opportunity to be politically reorganized, which black folks were able to take some advantage. Now, is it to the level that we want? No. But there's a, you had an advantage there that you did not have here because Missouri was hiding as being part of the Midwest, but really was still 1863 the South. That's what you're facing here today. And that's my political analysis. Now, you might challenge that, but put your facts on the table, and I'll put mine, and we'll see who wins out on that. Because when you're talking about analysis, you have to have facts. And those, that is the fact of the matter of what actually happened. Now, it is necessary for us those of us that have some positions to do some, both analysis of that information, critique and description, and further articulating that to our community so our people will recognize that we are having victories. Not to the extent that we want, but we are moving this needle further and further in the direction that we want. Now, there's another historical fact. Every time America perceives that African Americans or people of color are making advancements, there is a white backlash. Let's look at it. Let's go back to the Civil War. Civil War ended. Reconstruction started. The, the North moved out of the South around what? The, the 1880s, late 1870s, early 1880s. What happened? The rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the white backlash. Okay, then civil rights, black, well, we can go before, we can go before that. The Back to Africa movement, or what we call the Black Empowerment Movement with Marcus Garvey and the rest of that, what happened? Well, that empowerment movement back in the early 1920s also included the creation of Black History Month, because Black History Month was created in what, 19, actually 1926, 1925. Um, there was a backlash. That backlash ended up in the incarceration of Marcus Garvey and the deportation of him. Why backlash? That was when Hoover, over with the FBI, got started. And their first target was Marcus Garvey. So they can talk about all the bad white, uh, 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 what do you call them, gangsters they want to, but their first target was Marcus Garvey. Historical fact. White backlash. Civil rights, black power movement white backlash. Again, Hoover was involved because he created what was called the COINTELPRO. That was when they actually infiltrated, infiltrated the NAACP, SNCC and these organizations, and the more radical ones like the Black Panthers, and caused them to try to fight one another. White backlash. America perceived the election of Obama as an advancement for us. Now what we got? Trump. If that's not a backlash, then but what they did, they might have shot themselves in their own foot this time by electing him. However, the trend for that happens. My point is, is that we must not get ourselves confused and think that something is wrong when the backlash happens. What, what history has also shown us is that when it happens, we never go as far back as we were before. But we do lose some advances that we made. So when we have the opportunity for advancement, it makes sense for us to take it as far as we can. 
so that when it happens and we do have to roll back some, we don't go back as far as where we started. So the correct analysis can inspire us to continue to work, but we cannot allow other people to describe our historical facts and interpret things for us. We have to do that ourselves. You said something that um, I've been, I say it a lot, not a lot publicly, but when I'm having conversations, I say it, and I feel, when I say it, I say it's a tool. But the way you just described it is backlash. When you said that they caused these movements to fight against each other and yes. be distracted with that, that is somewhat how I feel now today, that there's backlash and that they keep us fighting over things while they're planning things. And when I say there, so that we're not mistaken, I'm talking about the African-American elected officials, the African-American leadership, the community, the African-American community. I believe that sometimes we fight and get into things that are so petty and have nothing to do with the movement and the advancement of not just our people, but our communities. And at the same time, simultaneously, they're joking about it, laughing about it, and planning and getting things done. Mm -hmm. So what you just said, that really resonated with me, um, you know, with that, and now I have another way to put it, backlash. <laughs> it, if I can, I had, you know, I had the opportunity, you know, my father was elected in, as an alderman, uh, what, in 1967. And so, you know, St. Louis had a bus boycott. When the uh, bi-state was created and they didn't want to hire black drivers, it was a bus boycott. And so our community, I remember being, I think it was a Criteria Theater, theater down on Dr. King. Regal Theater, this old raggedy place. But you know, it held a whole lot of people. And so they met, had a public meeting there to organize what was gonna be the response. Uh, Congressman Clay had just been recently elected. Mm -hmm. So he was there, all of your black committee people, your black aldermen were there, your black clergy were there, the um, different organizations were there, NAACP, Urban League, you name them the more radical ones, the black liberators, the black patriot party, the uh, Zulu 500, all the, there were groups in St. Louis with these names, y'all. They were all there, and many of them disagreed with each other, but the first thing they said publicly is that we did not come here to fight each other. Yeah. And so then we're not gonna allow you to speak in that way. So be clear, we came here to work on our common issue together, mm. and they all made a pact to deal with that issue and none of the problems between each other. And they did. Wow. And we're, we're talking about not 10 people, we're talking some five or 600 people in a public meeting organizing this. And wow. their first commitment was not to fight one another. They organized a serious, one of the people who was young back then was uh, Charles Quincy Troop. Oh, wow. Who later became a state representative. Mm -hmm. He was one of the, became one of the union organizers mm -hmm. for the uh, bi-state black workers. Um, they said then that uh, they were going to shut by state down, and they did it. Um, many of the black committee men and women owned cab companies, the Marcella Cab Company, the wow. Allen Cab Company. So those cab companies, those who are old enough, you might remember, provided free rides for black folks. Then you had the service cars. The service car, ah, see, uh -huh, you're dating yourself. I didn't know, I didn't see this, I just read about this. <laughs> <laughs> But they, uh, the service cars, they already provided a route. Yeah. These were black cabs. They were really, what do you call those uh, um, sedans? What do you call those, those fancy cars? Nonetheless, uh, limousines. Mm -hmm. And so the limousine, you could, it, it rode a route. And so you can get on it during this time period for free. Wow. And then many of the black churches would, could, would create, would fix lunches for the people riding people around for free. Mm -hmm. So it was a community united for yeah. empowerment. And we can do that. Yes. But first we have to drop this thing about something's wrong with us. That's really the victim blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you put a bunch of people in a bad situation and not expect them, some of them, not to, to act bad. Well, they're going to act crazy. Mm -hmm. So we have to begin to say, no, we're not doing that. We're going to stick to the issue and make sure that we support that and not allow it to happen. So don't. If somebody starts, a sh you, you have a public meeting and y'all trying to deal with an issue and somebody go astray, don't support that ignorance. Right. Just say, sister, brother, we don't need you to talk about that right now. We're on this. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So you had people like, oh, Ivory Perry there, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Percy Green, just all these. You know, they weren't big names back then. Mm -hmm. They were just young folks. But that's, I saw that myself as wow. an approach to organizing. So we use that same thing when it came to our student organizations. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the Black Student Union and the rest of that. Um, 
the, I was the president of our Black Student Union in high school. Mm -hmm. That's the radical organization. Our treasurer was Darlene Green. Oh, wow. She's been a treasurer <laughs> a long time. I mean, we, wow. had a whole, we had a whole $200. We was rich. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, so speaking back to coming together as a community mm -hmm. collectively to fight against issues. So one of the issues now, I can be specific, we have so many, I know, starting with public safety. But before we get to public safety, since we're in this area, mm -hmm. right now is um, the big gentrification, the big word right. gentrification. And remember right. I told you that when I was kind of studying it, I was saying, oh, people are scared of gentrification because they don't get to stay around and enjoy it. The gentrification itself was, wasn't bad, but it was the people that get pushed out right. and um, don't get to stay around and enjoy it that it mm -hmm. becomes bad for. And you corrected me and said, no, it's a real thing. Gentrification is a yeah. real thing. Mm -hmm. So can you speak on that? And, um, well, we have, well, I mean, there's several examples already here in the city of St. Louis. You know, what happened with Mill Creek? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the area, you know, around Harris Stone. You're, there's some Mill Creek descendants here? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, Mill Creek, Vashon High School served the, the black community that was Mill Creek. Mill Creek, like Sumner, served the Ville. Mm -hmm. And that Mill Creek area is the one that's around Harris Stowe. That, or Harris Stowe, you know, is an old Vashon High School, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where it is now. So that area was completely uh, emptied out under urban renewal. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are other examples of that. Uh, when this is much even er, much earlier than that, mm -hmm. uh, even during the slavery days, when there was a, a community of free black folks living in what was now now considered to be Old North St. Louis, mm -hmm. they too were uprooted and, and moved out because you know, they didn't have any rights really mm -hmm. uh, to be respected. Um, that is a trend; it's not anything new. Mm -hmm. And so then we as a community just have to have to organize ourselves and be prepared for it. Now. You can, you can feel that, you know, the, the notion is, is that you will create what they're calling these diversified communities that have, in theory, mixed economic brackets mm -hmm. and diversity. Diversity does not mean that everybody has, diversity, it is not a diverse community if simply the people there may have different colors, but they are all acting the same way. That's Come not on. diversity. Say that. The idea yeah. of diversity is that there will be people of different hues and cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. But America still has cultural intolerance. You are right to be black if you sound like them. Mm -hmm. And I even said that to some of the mayors here. Okay, you can hire certain black folks in your, in your office, but you're not hiring any black person from St. Louis that speaks Ebonics. Mm -hmm. If they don't speak exactly how you sound, you can't accept them. Either they're considered ignorant or inferior, and therefore you don't hire them in your office. Hmm. Uh, and that, that is the trend. And we have to be clear about that ourselves, that education does not mean you have to be assimilated into their cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can bring Kwanzaa down to City Hall. OK. You know. <laughs> right, right. But, but in answer to your question, it is an ongoing fight. And mm -hmm. we just have to be clear uh, ways to fight it. Mm -hmm. um, one of those, of course, is through the use of eminent domain and not allowing that to happen unless it is controlled by the neighborhood organization. What I mean by that? We need very active community organizations yes. in our neighborhoods. Not just, we need block units, but we need neighborhood organizations. Yes. I mean, this particular one, you have a pretty active. A very active the neighborhood. The Academy of Sherman Park yes. Neighborhood and I would recognize our president, right. and our president of the Academy of Sherman Park Association is here, Ms. Catherine Smith. Doctor, how are you? Yes. Mm -hmm. And Sherry the Bailey here from the, they, they right. are doing an amazing job of right. fighting that narrative mm -hmm. that's going on um, now and making sure that, that we're heard and we're listened and respected. And I admire them for taking that on instead of um, escalating it, taking it on, yes. Yeah, so. You have to keep each other informed too. There may be yeah. things that you find out as an organization that your older person doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Let them know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very clear. We had that really. Yeah, at one point, this whole, this whole neighborhood was in the 18th. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the relationship that I had with them was that, you know, you hear something I ain't heard about. If you think I haven't heard about it, let me know. Let me because know. I'm certainly calling you to let you know Absolutely. what's going on. In that way, you, stay, you can stay unified and nobody can break your unity by giving you a little peace. 
and Come keeping on. your elected official Come uninformed. On. Uh, there is a tendency for, um, uh, let's be clear, I mean, racism still exists. There's still that tendency in America where non-people of color uh, will not disseminate information to our community. And so they may tell you, not thinking that you have a relationship or that you're mad at your elected official, won't tell There we go. Don't be that mad. Because that kind of mad is insane. Yes, sir. And it's so we want to be sure that no matter how much they may, you may not like the person, that position has some power that you can, that can help in that effort. Mm -hmm. And so then you as the elected official, and when you have a united community, you can get all kind of stuff yes. done. Okay? Yes. Uh, we had, you know, when I, can I speak on that a little bit about the mm -hmm. 18th and the, at that time? Uh, when I first came into office back in 1989, we had a bunch of block units. And it was clear to me that the city was not going to do any planning for our war. I didn't want them to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So I wrote my own review of each community, their strengths and the challenges. Mm -hmm. And then I put in there what I felt was the call. The call was to unite all those block units. Mm -hmm. And so we did into neighborhood organizations. We didn't, demin we didn't get rid of the block units. They fed into the neighborhood organization. Mm -hmm. And so the first one, because that was the one that was in the worst condition, was the Vandervenner neighborhood. That's that area between Taylor and Vandervenner, roughly Evans over to uh, Washington. Mm -hmm. We created what was called the Vandervenner Citizens for a Better Community. I didn't create it. I, you know, I empowered folks to do that by working with them, helping them to write the bylaws and the rest of that. Uh, that organization then went about creating a neighborhood plan. It was called the North Central Plan. We did that. We got it done finally about 1999. Got it done. Uh, published it in 2001. We wrote the things ourselves. I mean, I, these hands I wrote. I got it said, I got a college degree. I can write. Let me write. So we wrote this plan. Comprehensive. Then we got it published. Then I was moving to get the city to adopt it. And how the universe operates. These elders said, even if we don't get a dime to get this plan implemented, we have to let the next generation know we had a vision for living in our community. So write it down. With the, our next generation must know that we as elders have a vision on how we want this community to look. So we have a, a document to pass on. They were committed to doing that. Once we got it done, we started working on implementing parts of it. Then finally, by some fluke, America elected Obama. And by his work, he came up with the stimulus package. And when he looked around for black communities who had a plan already in place, he found the Vanderbilt neighborhood in the North Central plan. So those new houses that you see over on North Sarah came from the stimulus package because our community was already written with a plan. Already ready. Already ready. Before. That's what's up. That's now, what's up. My point, my other point there is that it takes vision work. If you're busy mm -hmm. just dealing with the alley and the trash and the lights, you'll mm -hmm. never do the visionary work mm -hmm. that's necessary to build for the future. Mm -hmm. You have to address that, but also make sure that you put the time to the visionary work. Absolutely. Okay. And again, not being the communication part, I think is big, and that speaks to the working collectively, not being distracted, not being worried about who's doing what and you're not doing it if it's not in your name or you didn't wasn't invited, okay. you know, and things like that. That that kind of Distract, distractive backlash now, I'm learning how to put that's it, it's it gonna, you know, mm -hmm. will help us. And so that's absolutely gonna speak to the next big thing that I wanted to talk to you about, the war reduction. Mm. And if it goes down, and if you don't know what that is, so right now St. Louis has 28 wards, and it has been passed, voted on and passed, that we will be reduced to 14 wards. Correct. So me as a freshman, speaking to my elder, how do I plan to prepare for that? Because I know that there are movements to try to get it back on the ballot, and right. of course I supported that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, my mind works like I still need to be planning and preparing right. for that. Mm -hmm. So what would you tell me in advice for that? Uh, get to work. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, me, let me tell it to you this way. St. Louis, this area was a French territory. We have to be clear. America's history is measured by the English colonies, not by the French colonies. So you don't learn much about St. Louis because this was a French territory. Until around the 1890s, early 1900s, the, there were two major languages in St. Louis, and that was French and English. 
and I'm not just getting this from reading, though my you know, background is in history. I'm not getting it from there. My grandfather was born 1883. My mother's father, he didn't die in 1973 when I was, after I graduated from high school. He could talk about that. So, I mean, he was 21 when the World's Fair happened. So I didn't learn that Scott Joplin didn't play in the World's Fair by reading a book. I learned it across the kitchen table from my grandfather who saw that they wouldn't let him in the World's Fair. Um, my, my point being here, at one point, St. Louis had a more French-style government. It had what they call a bicameral system. It had a House of Delegates and it had a city council, like the House of Representatives and the Senate, a French system. When St. Louis got a big influx of Germans, then it flipped. When the French, and they don't tell you this, but you can find it in a Post and Globe newspaper, the French and the Germans actually had fights on the street because the French felt that they, they, they founded this place, they had a right to it, the Germans better get away. Well, they fought. Uh, it was more Germans than French, and many of the French either went up to Canada or went down to St. Genevieve. What happened? They flipped the government from a two-tier system of having a house of delegates and a city council to a single board of aldermen. Aldermen being a German word meaning elder man. They had no intents of women being a part of this council, being a part of this board. Now, suddenly, that the city, and this is my political analysis, in my opinion, I spoke about this on the floor of the board because I opposed it. Now that we are seeing that there, the city is looking at having a predominantly black board of aldermen, a black comptroller, and a black mayor all at the same time, which has never happened in the city of St. Louis, now it's time to reduce the size of the board of aldermen from 28 to 14. Now, if you're sin what I said on the floor is that if you're sincere about it, you're sincere about saving money and reorganizing things, then start from the top. Look at the mayor's office and look at the whole thing, analyze it, have public conversation about it, and redesign it from the top to the bottom. That's what they did back in, in 1914. But they're not doing it because that was not their issue. It is easier to amass seven or eight votes than it is 14 votes, meaning that a mayor could influence enough all the people with his 14, all they need is eight, to control what's happening than they can for 15 votes. And that's what you're looking, this is really was a, in my opinion, a power play. Now you could think that, well, why does a city this size need a Board of Aldermen this big? Well, you had more people than that when you had the two-tier system and less people living in the city at the time. So you have to, be, history informs you in a way that nothing else can. And if you don't know it, they can tell you anything. And that's been part of our problem. But that's the fight that we, our fight was not only to hear about our history, but have it told in a way that empowers us. You know, again, you don't, the li if you listen to the lion telling the story, if all the lambs listen to the stories of the lion or the hunt, the lambs would always lose. But the lambs will tell the story about how the ones got away. But the lion not going to tell that one. You, you follow. Wow. So we have to be clear that we have to do this analysis ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, my point is that if you reduce it down to 14, it makes it easier to amass eight votes. But still further, this thing was determined to be changed to 14 with no plan on how that is to be done. Why? There are 15 committees at the Board of Aldermen. What do you do? Are those to be reduced? Presently, you've been to the meetings. You can have a committee meeting that goes four hours. Mm -hmm. Now, the present HUD's committee was divided into two committees because the meetings were so long. It is now you have the HUD's committee mm -hmm. and the Neighborhood Development yeah. Committee. That was because all those bills used to be heard in one committee, and oh, they wow. would go seven hours. Yeah. Now, the Board of Aldermen still will have to have the same, it still will have the same amount of board bills. You have about five to 600 pieces of legislation a year coming through the Board of Aldermen. That includes resolutions and board bills. Mm -hmm. You're gonna reduce it down to 14 people. The job is still a part-time pay. Mm -hmm. There is one secretary for every six aldermen. Yep. Now you're going to have a secretary, one secretary for maybe two aldermen, but more work because their districts will be bigger. bigger. Mm -hmm. In our communities, more issues because you've got more, a bigger more. district mm -hmm. and no resources. So if you really were going to do it right, you would have to make the Board of Aldermen position full time. That's somewhere around $90,000, $100,000 they would need to be paid. Plus, they would need to have a personal secretary and 
an assistant, an assistant and assistant. an outreach person. So there's no way that you can adequately, now that, let's go further, then you gotta have another attorney. There's no way you oh, can yeah. adequately function as a legislative branch if you reduce it down to 14 without increasing the staff. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to keep the legislative branch crippled because that is the checks and balances to the administrative branch, wow. to the mayor's office. Mm -hmm. So if they're unable to function well, then you don't have the checks and balances to the administrative branch and they can just do whatever they want. I'm not talking about any particular mayor. Right. I'm talking about the structure the itself right. and my analysis of why I think that that was not a good idea. Now, I was an alderman for 30 years, so I'm basing yeah. it upon something. Mm -hmm. From 1989 to 2019, mm -hmm. I had not intended to be there anywhere near that long. <laughs> I had to be convinced to run. Wow. Let alone be there 30 years. I was two when I was elected. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how I thought I was going to keep this down to an hour, but I know, so I know my time is probably running out quickly. Sure can, you, can you just touch on the public safety piece for us as a family, mm -hmm. what, what your analysis of what you think the, it, one of the underlying or service issues is and how you think we can better it? About crime? Mm -hmm. There are several indicators. Um, when I was chairman of the Public Safety Committee, we brought in experts from Washington University, UMSL, which has, you know, one of the leading criminology departments in the country, and a couple of people from out of town. They say that crime indicators, there are indicators, things that show you, that point to areas that can end up in high crime. One, poor educational system. Oh, education. Two, lack of health care. Mm -hmm. Three, lack of employment opportunities. Four, poor housing. Five, racism. Mm. That is one of the indicators. So if you have an area that has a high raci racial issues, then expect crime. They're mm. saying that that leads into crime because that creates other kinds of disenfranchisement. The other issues in include uh, lack of services mm. and uh, recreational activities for youth in the area. Mm. It is. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have those kind of issues in our community. It's not by accident. Um, it, is, it is a result, result of the disenfranchisement that we have had mm -hmm. for generations. Mm -hmm. So anybody talked about, you know, black folks just don't go around and try to just, you know, we just, you don't wake up. You know, you're not born as a child, so I'm just going to start doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. There are conditions to help move a person in there, unless there's something psychologically wrong. Mm -hmm. All the experts are saying is that the external conditions can move a person into that. Mm -hmm. And when you do that and sustain those conditions for generations, it becomes a lifestyle in wow. that community. Mm -hmm. So you can, in my opinion, you can get rid of it by getting rid of those five issues. You can reduce it by dealing with those five issues. Most mm -hmm. of the experts say, that if you had, I'm just quoting experts, mm -hmm. most of the experts say that if you direct programming at youth and their families, the younger the better, and sustain yeah. that programming yeah. over years, you're not going to see the results in two, three years. You're talking about 10, 15 years down the road. This is what the experts say. Mm -hmm. So at the time, our caucus, this is before you got there, mm -hmm. we pushed to get a million dollars a year for youth programming. Mm -hmm. That was called Prop S. Mm -hmm. And that was to be aimed particularly at programs that were not in the mainstream and get, you know, like the big groups that get funding from all over the place. It was really aimed at those smaller units that were in the neighborhoods doing stuff with those children. Mm -hmm. uh, and that million dollars, it, after we got it allocated, we had to fight to get it spent. Wow. Because there, were, uh, there was a faction, a very conservative alderman, who felt that crime prevention meant buying bars and locks for windows as mm -hmm. opposed to, pro the experts say bars and locks don't do nothing. What you need is programming. Mm -hmm. And St. Louis had one of the premier programs that helped reduce crime and increased the educational output of our children. That was called Caring Communities. That was wow. created by Khatib Wahid. Yes. Mm -hmm. If the thing went national and international, then the state of Missouri defunded it. Wow. So, what was your question to me? <laughs> yeah, so th those, if you get rid of those indicators, yeah. mm -hmm. you can help improve the conditions of a community. But racism is at the key of it. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the linchpins. And St. Louis has not faced straightforward as racial issues. You know, you can call it whatever That's you it. want. That's you it. can come up with new phrases. You can call it equity. You can call it whatever. You know, mm -hmm. you can call it blue, yellow. It's still racism. 
That's it. And the disenfranchisement that comes from it. And we cannot allow other people to start defining what we consider are the problems and the solutions. Mm -hmm. You can't, it's called paternalism when somebody else comes to your community and tells you how you're going to solve your problem. Mm -hmm. That's called paternalism. They're going to act mm -hmm. like your parent. Mm -hmm. True liberation comes indigenously from the people themselves. Mm -hmm. So if we're really talking about helping our community, that means our allies who consider who are white, they have to listen to us on how we want to be free. Mm -hmm. And not determine for us what freedom should look like for us. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so I get that almost answered my last question because I was just going to ask you for what you know, just a final note of what what you can speak to us. Mm -hmm. Culminating Black History Month, knowing the issues that we have in St. Louis City, mm -hmm. knowing the issues that um, we have in, in the upcoming changes in St. Louis City. Just what what word would you tell? What what advice or charge would you give to us as the action steps to move? There's a Swahili term that says "Pamoja mm tutashinda," -hmm. that means together we will win. Mm. That slogan. Mm. We, must, we must recognize that you are not oppressed because your name is Shemin, mm. and that you're not oppressed because your name is Christina, or your name is Sam, mm. or your name is Bob, or even your name is Mobutu. You're oppressed because you're black like the rest of us. Mm. And that America still has this racial issue. Mm. And so then we must unite. And there are some people of goodwill on the other side, meaning, mm -hmm. you know, who, who exist on the other side. We should unite on them. Mm -hmm. But we need to do it our way. If our way of holding a public meeting is to have food in the back and pray in the front mm -hmm. and dance in the middle, then we do it our way. Okay. That we don't have to start doing it the way they do it because then it's no longer our movement. Mm -hmm. It has to be our way. If you want to start off with a prayer and then have a rap, cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do it. Mm -hmm. We must do it our way. Otherwise, we can't. So one, together we will win. Mm -hmm. Two, that change is inevitable. Hmm. People say nothing changed. You different than what you were yesterday. Amen. You're certainly different than what you were 10 years ago. Amen. You don't look the same. You may be right. a little plumper, a little thinner. Hmm. Your hair might not be quite the same. Change is inevitable. Hmm. So it's not whether or not things will change. The question is, do we have the power enough to change it in the direction that we want? Yeah. Because it is inevitable. Change is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So oh, we don't have to worry about that. We just have to push to make sure it happens. So one, Together, Together we will win. win. Two, change is inevitable, so we must push to make it happen. Three, we have victories all over the place. Yeah. Where we must recognize and celebrate our victories. Mm -hmm. When we see something good, let them know. You know, ooh, sister, that was good what you yeah. did. Oh, brother, what you did over there. Thank goodness you here. Let them know. Mm -hmm. But we be quick to cut them down. We oh. know I didn't like his shoes no way. Right, <laughs> right, right, mm -hmm. right. You're right. Yeah, I didn't like his shoes, but... That's because we start imitating other communities. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the way our community would do things, and mm -hmm. so we don't need to start it. Mm -hmm. So one, together, together we win. win. Two, change is inevitable. Mm -hmm. We just need to push. Three, victories all over the place. Let's recognize them and celebrate them. Let me give you this quick example. Vashon High School at the time I went was on Grand and West Bell. Mm -hmm. We better not go over to the Fox. And we had better not go over to Powell Symphony Hall. And they used to have a place right next to the Fox called Wash Martha Washington Ice Cream Parlor. You couldn't go up in Martha Washington. When I was in high school in 69, right now, right across the street, we got Gary's, a black-owned restaurant. Amen. You hear the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Changes happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They weren't hiring black bus drivers. We got them today. In fact, they're pr predominantly that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have other types of things in schools within it. Change is happening. Mm -hmm. We must celebrate it and recognize it and hold it up because a people who are depressed will not continue to fight. Right, right. They lose that hope. So that's our job to help inspire each generation and ourselves and mm -hmm. to recognize that the ability for us to sit here. Y'all know this used to be a Jewish-owned building, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that... Okay, you're really man. Now, when I, when I was in Vashon, this area was mostly white. Soul Dam was mostly white mm -hmm. when I was in high. Northwest was predominantly white. That whole, what you call Walnut Park, was a white area. Wow. My point. What, what is my point? We're now sitting in this building. Amen. You're following. Right. Change yeah. happened. That's right. We're now, now going into the Fox. Now, that's cool, but we did have a, a setback in that we lost some black businesses. Now we have to rebuild. But if we're clear about what conditions we're in and that this is not like the rest of the Midwest, 
that we're fighting stuff from back in 1864, <laughs> right. then we can be clear how much work it will take, how much energy we'll put to it, and then more clearly recognize the victories that we have in this environment, because it is not like living in Chicago or Atlanta. Okay. Right. So those are the things I would say. Together. together we will win. Mm -hmm. To recognize that change is inevitable, just need to push it our way, celebrate our victories. And what was the last one? Don't nobody remember what I'm talking for. Without celebrate the celebrate victories, was, victories. Yeah. make sure that we celebrate our victories yeah. and hold them up. Yeah, hold mm -hmm. on. Yeah. And just one of the key thing I just mentioned, if you hear one of the themes I'm, I'm saying here is our right to, to self-determination. Hmm. Not just fighting a battle somebody else the way they do it, but mm -hmm. fighting this battle the way we do it. If, if for us is to go out and to sing on the picket line, then do it. Then do it. If for us is to do the rap, do it, but we must do it our way, or it is not our movement. Mm -hmm. You cannot fight with other people's weapons. Mm. It has to come naturally from you. Right there. It has to come naturally That's from you. That's it right there. Okay. Thank you. I like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to thank all of you all for sitting here and listening to the conversation. I wasn't yes. sure what to expect today. He was. <laughs> thank you. But thank you all so much. she's a talented freshman alderman. Oh, thank all you. Woman. I received yes, it. Thank you. Good things we know going to come from her. Thank you. Yeah. I received it. So thank you, Aya. This was a, um, give him one more round of applause, please, because I'm so appreciative of him coming right. I'm so, he going to say. <laughs> I'm so appreciative of him coming out.